Before I dive into God's Word this morning, I'm reminded of the value of Christian worship for so many different reasons. But as the events of yesterday unfolded and the news shows all sorts of um, dark, depressing things, I'm reminded in a moment like this, the value of Christian worship where we take the focus off of ourselves and we focus it on the Lord. Let me read a few verses from Psalm 37 this morning, a Psalm of David. It says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger, and turn away from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Let's just pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, your your world, we see the signs of brokenness and corruption every day. Your word reminds us that all creation groans. We see the brokenness of this world, the sin, the evil, and sometimes it feels like this world is spinning out of control and we are lost and helpless. Sometimes we feel despair, sometimes we feel anger. But in the midst of all of this, Lord, you reign. You are almighty. You are powerful. You love us. And because of Jesus, we have abundant eternal hope. Lord, I pray that as your people in the days to come, as we respond to all sorts of things that we encounter on the news or face in our world, that we would be like the psalmist here who trusts the Lord and displays meekness and peace, following in the way of Jesus. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I was cleaning out a box of old items in our house earlier, uh, a week or two ago, and I stumbled across this. This is a Rubik's Cube. I purchased this maybe 15, 20 years ago. I don't know why I still have it. I have never been able to solve it. Uh, Anyone in here know how to solve one of these things? Oh, we have one. One person. Well, I'll just toss it out to you, okay? I've never been able to solve this. I've always thought it was fascinating. I think it'd be interesting to learn how to solve, uh, you know, something that you just kind of can play with and it's just kind of an interesting little puzzle. I've just never been able to do it. And I, I, when I found this in a box, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'll spend a little time playing with it. It was so dusty that it was hard to actually turn the pieces because I was going to look on YouTube to figure out how to solve it. And it was just too frustrating, and I kind of gave up and left it um, for the boys to play with. And then I got to thinking about the message for this morning. And I think that for a lot of people, the Bible feels a lot like this Rubik's Cube. We know there are connections. We know there are things that are supposed to line up and make sense. We know that scripture has some kind of cohesive unity, but we don't always know how to solve the puzzle, do we? We may look at the pieces. We may see that there are connections or there are supposed to be connections. And we may turn it around and spin it around in our minds, but we never do solve it, do we? 
And for some people, this frustration is so great, and so they give up. They quit trying to make sense of it at all. But then there are some who are just happy to make whatever connections feel right to them. Whatever connections make them feel most comfortable or encouraged. But neither of those extremes are helpful or healthy when it comes to reading the Bible. For many people, the Bible can be a complicated, confusing, even challenging book, and for some, it's unsolvable. But thankfully, this book is not impossible. It's intended to be understood, but it does demand that we take it seriously. We must learn to read the Bible the way it was intended to be read. See, a lot of times we've been taught to read the Bible in just bite-sized chunks. We read a verse here, we read a verse there, we read the Bible bit by bit. Maybe we get a verse of the day calendar, or you have a verse of the day that pops up on your phone. A verse of the day to keep the devil away, right? And we still remained confused on the big vision, the big picture of the Bible. In his book, A Concise Guide to Reading the New Testament, David Neuenhaus describes the problem. He says that many of the college students in his Bible classes struggle to understand the Bible. And the reason, he says, is because they have been trained to be Bible quoters, not Bible readers. In other words, they know the bits and pieces of the Bible, but they don't know the whole story. They don't know how all the pieces fit together. You know, if you go online and you're trying to figure out how to solve one of these things, there's some suggestions on there how to do it. You take it apart and you put it back together. And you know, there's some people that try to do that to the Bible. They just take bits and pieces of it out and try to put it together in a way that makes sense for them rather than its intention. How do these pieces fit together? If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 15 this morning. You know, we've been trying to do this very thing in our church since the beginning of the year. We started this Together 24 Bible reading campaign, where instead of just reading bits and pieces of God's Word, just instead of a verse here or a verse there, we're reading whole books of the Bible together. And our goal is to see Scripture in its context, to understand the story and the motivation and the goal of the biblical authors and the divine author. The truth is we will never solve the puzzle of the Bible until we look at the whole thing in its context. We've got to see its big picture to under understand its big purpose. But look at these words from Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 29. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. Jesus went up a mountainside and sat down. Now, I, I know it doesn't sound like very much. It's probably not the verse that you read on your verse of the day calendar. But this verse, this little line in Matthew's gospel ought to trigger something in your memory. It, it, it should start to make some connections for you this morning. Oh, look at there. The, con the, the connections are starting to fall in place, aren't they? Better put that down before I make a bigger mess. 
Do you remember just a few chapters earlier in Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus sees the crowds of people. They've all clamored to see him, and he sees them. And he goes up to a mountainside, and he sits down, and he begins to teach them. For chapter after chapter after chapter, for three chapters, Jesus teaches with authority. Great authority, authority that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes. And we are starting to make those connections, aren't we? Matthew wants his readers to pay attention that just as Moses received the law on top of the mountain, Jesus is now on a mountain as well. Jesus is the rightful interpreter of the law because he himself is the rightful law giver. Matthew wants us to see this connection between Moses and Jesus. He wants us to see that Jesus is the one that fulfills the law, that brings it to completion. He wants us to see that Jesus is the one that fulfills the story of Israel that began way back in Genesis and in Exodus. So Jesus sits down. And in those days, this is kind of a signal that a rabbi is about to teach, instruct, Jesus came to teach, he came to meet their spiritual needs, but Jesus cares about the whole person. And he looks at the crowds of people there, and he's concerned about their physical needs as well. After three days of ministry, these people need food, they're hungry. Many of them are desperate and hurting. Uh, Matthew tells us that the crowd is filled with the sick and the lame and the diseased and the crippled. These were often the neglected, ignored, abandoned people cast aside by society. And so I don't think it's an exaggeration here when Jesus says in verse 32 that he's concerned about them, that they might collapse on the way. Jesus has compassion on this crowd, but his disciples, they're concerned. This is a remote place. There's too many people. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough bread. Send these people home. Send them home. We can't deal with this. And that's why the question that Jesus asks is so interesting. He simply says, how much do you have? The answer? Seven loaves and some fish. Let me interpret that. Not enough to feed 4,000 people probably enough to feed their group. There's 12 apostles and one rabbi, Jesus. There's 13. They've got seven loaves of bread. There's probably enough to just feed them, but there's not enough to feed the rest of these crowd of people. This is a remote place. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough bread. There's too many people. There's too many people who don't have um, enough to eat today. So Jesus just send them home. But look what happens next. Verse 35, he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men, besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into a boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. See, Jesus, he's more than just a powerful, authoritative teacher. He's more than just a nice, compassionate man who cares for the poor. He's more than just a physician and a healer. Jesus is our provider. Have you ever stopped to consider the magnitude of this miracle? How much do you think it would take to feed 4,000 people? When we were living in Jacksonville, I have a friend, Roger, who owns a barbecue uh, uh, restaurant, a catering business, that is. And I asked Roger one time, how much it would take to feed 4,000 people? That's not something I typically do. You know, you've held dinner parties maybe or birthday parties or whatever they might be. You've, you've probably 
you know, hosted several people before, you probably never fed 4,000 people. And so I asked Roger, how much would it take? So he thought about that for a minute, and he said it would take 200 hogs to feed 4,000 people. Okay, he's thinking barbecue, right? He wasn't thinking fish and loaves. And then he said it would take 20 hours to cook all 200 of those hogs, if you were doing it at once. So imagine you're the apostles there. You've gathered, there's all of these people, 4,000 plus. You need a lot of food to serve these people. It's a remote place. They're hungry. They're hurting. The sick and the troubled, the abandoned. There's no way to feed them all. You need far more than seven loaves. But Matthew, again, wants to trigger our memory. Do you remember just one chapter earlier in chapter 14? This is not the first time that Jesus has done something like this. And we're starting to see the pieces connect and line up and make sense. It was a similar story. 5,000 people this time, five loaves, two fish, one incredible meal. Jesus feeds them all. Jesus fed the 5,000, and they had 12 basketfuls left over, one for each of the apostles, I always try to think. And now Jesus feeds 4,000, and they have seven baskets left over, a sign of completeness, a reminder that they began with seven loaves. So why are the disciples so worried? Why are they so worried that this is a remote place? Why are they worried that they don't have enough bread? Why are they worried that there are too many people? Why are they worried that they don't have enough? Jesus, he's capable of doing far more than we can ask or imagine. Tim Chester is a pastor, an author, a professor, and he writes, we need a theology of leftovers. I mean, is anything too hard for the Lord? If anything is too challenging for him, we need a theology of leftovers. What are the burdens that you carried in this morning? Is anything too hard for him? What are the concerns that are clouding your mind this morning? Is anything too hard for him? What are the sins that you have carried today? Is anything too hard for him? The concerns, the doubts, the worries, the fears, the aches, the pains, the grief. Is there anything that he can't handle? See, the disciples in this text, they're slowly, gradually learning about the nature and character of Jesus. They're learning to trust him. They're learning to trust in his compassion. They're learning to trust his power. They're learning to trust his authority. But there are some people who are simply not impressed. Look at the very next verse, chapter 16, starting in verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. After all that Jesus had said and done, after all of his teaching, after his miracles, after the healing, after this incredible feeding, in all the ways that Jesus has revealed himself to the people, they respond by saying, prove it. We want a sign, Jesus. We want evidence. We want proof. You see, they knew how to interpret the weather, but they didn't know how to interpret Jesus. 
They wanted a sign. They wanted some sort of spiritual confirmation. They wanted certainty. But what else could Jesus have done? What else would be good enough for them? See, they had made their mind up about Jesus already. Their hearts were cold and calloused and hard. They wanted a sign, but Jesus had already given them plenty, and they simply refused to believe. And maybe you've met people like that in your life. Maybe you've met people who are hesitant or resistant to a life of faith. Maybe you've met people who have refused to hear your testimony of God's love. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, they refuse to believe. It's hard, isn't it, to convince somebody who already has their mind made up. It's hard to convince someone whose heart is hard. And so Matthew again, once again, triggers our memory. The pieces are starting to fall into place. Back in chapter 12 of Matthew, just a few chapters earlier to this, a group of Pharisees asked Jesus for what? A sign. And just like this morning, Jesus replies. One theologian said it like this, just as Jonah remained in the belly of the fish for three days before he was delivered by God, so Jesus would remain in the belly of the earth for three days in order to deliver God's people from their sins. It's a powerful moment of teaching that foreshadows Christ's mission and purpose through the cross and the empty tomb, but Jesus has more to say and more to teach. Verse 5 of our text. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus and his disciples had been very busy. After serving loaves and fishes to the multitudes, after this confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, after all that Jesus has said and done, Jesus uses this quiet moment in the boat with his disciples to teach. And he gives them this warning, be on your guard. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. But the disciples, they don't seem to get it. They, they think he's disappointed by their lack of preparation. But Jesus is talking about something much deeper than that. But I mean, can you picture the scene on this boat? Anyone who has been a parent and have heard their children bickering in the other room know this scene, don't they? You forgot to buy, to buy bread when we were in town? How could you be so careless, Andrew? It was, your last, it was your turn last, Peter. Jesus interrupts their discussion with a question. He says, don't you understand? How much food was left over before? After the first miracle. How much after the second? How can you possibly worry about bread when you're with the bread of life? How can you worry about bread when you are traveling with the bread of life? Remember, we were supposed to be thinking about Moses. Matthew is making these connections. We just finished a sermon series through the book of Exodus. What happens when God's people are traveling through the wilderness and they're hungry? Doesn't the Lord provide? He gives them manna. 
How can you be worried about bread when you are traveling with the bread of life? And so that's when the light bulb finally goes off in verse 12. They finally see. They finally understand. They finally recognize that this is not about bread. This is about teaching. This is about truth. It's about the slow and steady influence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so Jesus is teaching them, be on your guard against their teaching because it won't satisfy. Only Jesus can provide for our deepest needs. Only Jesus can provide for our deepest needs. Only Jesus can satisfy. Oh, that doesn't stop us from trying, though, does it? We often look to other things to soothe our anxieties, to calm our fears, to settle our grief. We look to substances. We look to relationships. We look to distractions. We look to power. We look to all sorts of things to calm our fears, settle our minds and hearts, satisfy our souls. But none of those things last. Only Jesus can provide for our deepest needs. You see, Jesus, he is so much more than just a nice man, a good moral teacher or a miracle worker, a healer. He is, of course, all of those things. But Jesus is the bread of life. He is the manna in the wilderness. And only he can satisfy this hunger in our hearts. And so what is it that you are seeking after to fill that hunger in your heart? Is it Jesus or is it something else? Because only Jesus can satisfy and provide for our deepest needs. And these pieces are starting to fall in place. The question for us is, do you hunger and thirst for Jesus? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Oh, I pray that you would. I pray that you would. Because in my experience as a follower of Jesus, no matter what I go through, no matter the trials, no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, no matter the pain, no matter the cost, it is always worth it to travel with Jesus. And the message of the cross and the message of the empty tomb remind us that only Jesus can provide for our deepest needs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, there's something powerful that happens when we open up your word and rather than just taking a bit by bit we read it all, and we start to see the connections. We start to see this story that has been woven from the very beginning of your love and your grace and the assurance that we have in trusting in you. Lord, I pray this week that we would trust in you in all things, in every part of our lives, that we would surrender it all to you, walking hand in hand with you, because you alone provide for our deepest needs. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Together as we prepare for communion this morning.